So the next, we are going to have eight uh, papers. Um, basically, they are uh, being accepted by the uh, our our uh, CV in a wild workshop. Uh, for uh, there are in pa eight papers in total, and the first paper is called uh, "Learning Visual Representation from Modality Shared Contrastive Language Image Pre Training from uh, Hao Xuan Yo uh, from Columbia University." Um, and the second is "How Where Does the Clip Understand Texture." Uh, from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And third, a third paper is called uh, the Domain Compatible Synthetic Data Generation for Infrequent Object Detection from Amazon Team. And the fourth is called XMM, um, the Long-Term uh, Video Object Segmentation with an Atkinson uh, Schaeffering Memory mo uh, Model from uh, the UIUC team. And the fifth is called the AUGCO, the, A -U -G -C -O, the ACO, uh, the Augmentation Consistency Guided Self-Training for Source Free Domain Adaptive Semantic Segmentation. Uh, they're from the Georgia uh, Tech, uh, the UC Berkeley uh, team. And the, uh, the, the seventh paper is the Diffusion Models for Outfit Rendering, uh, Novel Conditioning Architectures for Subject-Driven Generation. Uh, they're from the Zalando uh, Research. An eighth paper is the OMDT, uh, the Language Aware Object Detection with Large Scale uh, Visual uh, Vision Language Multi Data Set Pre Training from the Carnegie Mellon. So, congratulations to all the papers being accepted by the workshop. Hi, everyone. This is Hao Xuan. I'm a computer science PhD student at Columbia University. Today, I'm going to present our we'll work on learning visual representation from modality shared contrastive language image pre-training, uh, as known as uh, MS clip. This work was done during my internship at Microsoft. Let's first talk about some background. Clip-like model has been quite popular in the last two years. It has a two separate text encoder and image encoder for feature extraction, and then it applies a contrastive loss on top between those two features for optimization. And in that way, it can learn a strong and transportable visual feature extractor for the downstream tasks. At the same time, let's have a look at the trend of the visual language neural network. So for visual model, it starts from a convolutional neural network. Then in recent years, a uh, variant transformer has been dominating more and more. And for language model, similar, it starts from recurrent neural networks, but then uh, slightly earlier than the variant model, it gradually evolves to a uh, transformer-like model. Since both failure and language modalities are used in clip-like framework, the natural question would be whether we can use a unified or shared transformer to extract the feature from those two modalities for the clip-like opportunity. Recent works has already tried to unify those two modalities, which further motivate us. For example, uh, in this paper named a Preacher Transformer as a Universal Computation Engine, they try to use a frozen language model in variant tasks, which by uh, fine-tuning only small number of parameters. Another relevant work is VTT. In this paper, they try to share the transformer weight for video and audio and text, but they find shared model perform worse than a specific model. In our work, we are specifically interested in which parts should be shared and which parts should be modality specific in a unified transformer framework of CLIP. And you can imagine a spectrum of the shared model versus a specific model. From totally shared to totally modality specific, you will have more number of parameters. Well, we want to study which sharing design can give us the best model, which means we want to have a strong performance while uh, with less parameters. And we want to further study why 
with such sharing design or specific design helps us to get better performance. Here we highlight what we found. We found basically sharing most of the parameters plus some auxiliary lightweight modality specific modules can bring both performance boost with parameter reduction. Then let's talk about some details of the methods in the following slides. First, we found that sharing all the parameters inside the transformer, including attention and that forward neural network, except for the layer normalizations, can give us comparable performance as opposed to a totally modality specific neural transformer. Second, we found early specialization is an efficient and effective modality specific component. So in our case, we begin with making only the first layer specialized for visual and text with other layers shared. For visual, we replace the transformer with six layers of convolution. And for text, we still use a, a specific uh, transformer. And the motivation is that it can help to align two modalities at the beginning, which provide a unified and, and more discriminative feature space for following shared parts. Lastly, we found that adding a parallel branch beside the shared transformer branch can provide additional performance boosts with only a few number of parameters. So for example, in image transformer, we add a, a like a five layers of shallow convolution and then we fuse the output of each layer to the uh, main shared transformer branch. Through ablation study, we found with about proposed three techniques, our MS clip can outperform original clip with less parameters. We also conduct different experiments on retrieval linear probing on 24 datasets, including some of the datasets in this workshop, and different visual backbones, as well as different pre training datasets. About more details, Feel free to check out our code and paper. Hello, everyone. I'm Chen Yun, and I'm happy to present our work from UMass Amherst on how well clip understands texture. Our work is focused on zero shot learning capabilities of clip on textures based on two motivations. Firstly, textures are useful for describing object categories, especially in fine grained domains. Secondly, the vocabulary for describing textures are rich and unique, so it's worth looking into whether the models like CLIP can work well on the domain of textures. We present our analysis in three parts. The first is zero-shot classification of textures. The second is associating textures with natural language phrases. And the third one is recognizing textures on bird images. For the first part, we apply zero-shot classification with CLIP on four texture classification datasets. We report per image accuracy on different variants of CLIP as shown in the table. And we can see that uh, the variants with uh, transformer backbones are better than um, resonant backbones. The best model is the last one, which is chained on larger images than other models in the table. We also experimented uh, with different prompts as listed in the table. We compare the basic versus the large version of the transformer backbone um, and show that the basic version has larger variance in performance across prompts. So we conclude that the larger models are more robust to prompt changes. For the second part, we study textures with natural language phrases. We use the DTD2 dataset, which has texture images and open vocabulary descriptions of the textures. We compare CLIP with DTML, which is a strong baseline um, from metric learning trained on DTD2 dataset. Uh, we, we have two tasks, a uh, phrase retrieval, which given the um, image and the uh, rank all the texture phrases and the image retrieval which is given a phrase and uh, rank all the texture images we can see that clip uh, performs similarly with the baseline 
uh, in uh, image retrieval, but it's uh, um, slightly worse on phrase retrieval. We then further look into the best and worst performing attributes in image retrieval on both models. We can see that uh, the two models are both good at common colors and patterns, such as white, black, soft. Um, on the other hand, Clip is better at relatively rare colors, such as orange, pink, purple, and uh, rare materials, such as wood, marble, and glass, while Clip is worse at words that are only frequent in DT2, but uh, rare in the um, uh, more open-ended vocabulary like uh, lined, bumpy, and rough. For the third part, we extend our experiments on natural uh, images in the fine-grained domain of birds, namely the CUP dataset, uh, which is a fine-grained bird dataset with localized attributes on body parts. Um, so the attributes include colors like red and gray and uh, um, patterns like solid or spotted. Um, we conduct a zero-shot phrase and image retrieval on texture attributes with both models. Um, so as shown in the table, we can see that clip is better on image retrieval than the DTML baseline, but the, they, their performance are similar on phrase retrieval. We further improve clip classification accuracy by adding localized uh, texture attributes to the prompts. Um, it, uh, and we find it especially effective when using scientific species names rather than common names of birds um, to fill into the prompt. So uh, we also show two examples here, which are two very similar species, but we can tell their difference uh, from the um, texture attribute descriptions. To conclude, we find Clip achieves strong zero-shot performance for not only texture classification and texture image and phrase retrieval, but also understanding textures of natural images of birds. Additionally, we find it effective to add texture attributes to prompts to help zero-shot classification. This is the end of our presentation and thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Ninat, and I'm going to present our paper titled Domain Compatible Synthetic Data Generation for Infrequent Objects Detection. So detection of some domain-specific and infrequent objects can be a crucial part of many computer vision-based systems. An example of a scenario is the detection of emergency vehicles for an autonomous driving car application. These emergency vehicles are rarely found in most available road scene data sets, and therefore training detection models can detect these types of vehicles is a challenging task. Additionally, acquiring emergency vehicle data set on the road is not straightforward, and the presence of emergency vehicles when collecting data is not guaranteed. Additionally, a high accuracy of detection is necessary for this due to safety concerns, such as detecting emergency vehicles on the road when their sirens are on. In this work, we aim at tackling this challenge by generating domain compliant synthetic data that sufficiently covers a variety of these types of objects. Using deep generative models for generating synthetic data for training downstream CE models has been proven to be a challenging task for several reasons. First is insufficient samples to train the generative model itself. A deep generative model relies on a sufficiently large number of images covering the object of interest in the training data set to be able to generate realistic images. This lack of sufficient images is the reason we need synthetic images in the first place, so this does not work for us. <clears throat> Another challenge is that there's insufficient diversity and scene complexity in current generated images. So there's been a huge progress in improving the quality of generated images by these deep generative models to the point that they're very close to the real thing. However, in the majority of cases, the AI generated images lack the required scene complexity and diversity which is essential for training downstream object detection models. Uh, third is that generated, labels, generated images may require labeling. So as opposed to synthetic images generated by rendering engines, AI generated images may still require a final annotation process to be ready for real world application. So our approach uh, attempts to tackle the above challenges and generate synthetic images that can be effectively used in real world applications. In this work, we investigate three different approaches of using a generative model that has been trained on a generic data set 
which is a filtered version of the LA ION 400M dataset. We fine tune this model for driving specifically by using a generic driving dataset, which is the BDD 100K dataset. Uh, the proposed approaches can be used to generate sufficiently large and complex and wildly diverse data sets from a very small relevant real data set. We use a diffusion-based model that can be conditioned on different information and can be partially masked during the generative process to make carefully controlled changes in the real images in a systematic way. This allows the generation of a large domain compatible data set that covers the required variety and complexity for training a downstream model. <clears throat> so this is the architecture of our proposed approach. We have two main blocks. The first block is the top half. What this top half block does is takes as input image, it takes some bounding boxes of various objects on the scene. And the essential idea is that we will mask portions of the image and ask the classifier free guided diffusion model to fill in this blank with specific items of interest. Then we will send it to an upsampling uh, super resolution model to generate the final image. And what we are asking the model to fill in depends on the approach. So in approach one, we'll talk about filling in with a emergency vehicle. In approach two, we will talk about filling it in with a synthetic background. The second portion is this bottom block here. So here we will use the super resolution model and some text to guide it to produce different global features, such as different weather or other things. So let's walk through the three different approaches. <clears throat> so the first approach involves masking a portion of the image and then using text guided uh, diffusion model to generate an emergency vehicle within the, Im within the masked portion, and then sending that to a super resolution model to get higher resolution. So here in the first row, you can see that the first column of images don't have any emergency vehicles. So we will mask a portion of the image and then we will use a prompt. So in the first is an ambulance driving in the street. In the second, it's a fire engine driving in the street. The diffusion model will generate a vehicle in the masked portion that is correctly blended. And then the super resolution model will increase the resolution of such an image. So the bottom, Sorry, the, the right column images are the final images that can be used for downstream modeling. The second approach is similar, but it's the inverse. So here we will take an image with a real emergency vehicle. We will crop that portion out and mask the rest of the image. And then we'll ask the diffusion model to provide a different background to the image. So here we can see that there is this real ambulance on a street. We will capture the ambulance mask out the background and then we will generate a new background from the model which is then passed to the high resolution super resolution model the third approach again is to change a global feature of the image by using a using the super resolution model so here we take the original image and then during super resolution we provided some text prompts and these text prompts will change the global Feature. So here we can see we can change it to a rainy image, snowy, or foggy. So some challenges from using these synthetic images. Uh, one challenge is the relative sizes of the generated object may not look correct. So for example, in this fourth image here, you can see that the generated police vehicle is in the foreground of the real one, but it is still smaller than the real one. So this does not make realistic sense as this would suggest that it's some sort of toy car rather than the real one. Another challenge is the quantity of synthetic objects. It's a bit hard to use text to convey quantity and say we want to have two or three or four different vehicles. And the third challenge is the relative position of the generated objects may not make sense from a realistic perspective. So for example, this third image, we see that the two generated vehicles are very close to each other, where in the real world that may not happen. And in the first image, we see that the generated vehicle is not even on the road, which may not happen in real world. To validate our idea, we train some downstream models using a real data set in training and testing. And then we augment the real data set with our synthetic data set and show 
downstream detection results. So this real data set is we call LAVA. It's from our partnership with the Lisa Lab at UC San Diego. We have some small set of real emergency vehicles. Then we have a small set of real emergency test vehicles. And then we generate the synthetic images based on the approaches that we mentioned. And we train various downstream object detection models of SSD flavors and efficient debt and fast RCNN. And we see that as we start incrementally adding synthetic data, the MAP on the real test set increases. So this is uh, some visual examples of the previous. So here we see some real test set images with some real emergency vehicles. And we see that our downstream model can detect them even when they are small or blurred. So in conclusion, we, in this work, we demonstrated a new approach for generating synthetic data for training downstream object detection models. The experimental results showed that incrementally adding synthetic images to your train set improves performance of these downstream models. As an extension of this work, we will consider more complex scenarios such as high occlusion or small objects. And we will also show the strength of our approach with different experimentation. So we'll repeat this experimentation on a test set that contains diverse emergency vehicles from different countries. Thank you for attending our talk. Hello, everyone. I'm Rex, and today I'm presenting our work, XMAM Long Term Video Optics Segmentation with an Eggleston driven memory model. First, let's look at the task. Video optics segmentation involves propagating the first frame mask to the rest of the video. On the bottom figure on the left, you can see that there's an image and a corresponding mask for the first frame. The, in, the model takes this as input and try to segment the same target object in the rest of the video. Notice that this mask of cast agnostic, meaning that the model has to deal with novel classes in test time, so it's more like an open world setting. Also, there are potentially multiple objects in the video. There can be a lot of occlusions, and there can also be objects with very similar appearances. Here we show some qualitative results of our method. The user first annotate the first frame with some interactive segmentation method. So the user annotated some objects of interest. And notice that the Dr. Pepper can is annotated with a red mask, while the Coca-Cola can is annotated with a green mask. Then we can fit this first frame, first frame mask into the, our model and let the model propagate the mask to the rest of the video. Since this is an open world setting, the model has never actually seen Dr. Pepper or Coca cans before. And these two cans have similar appearances, and the model has to extract those differences in appearances in test time. And next, we cover these two cans with a piece of tile. Um, we're trying to create a long term occlusion effect there. And since it's a long video of over 4,000 4, frames, with over 2,000 frames of them, uh, the two cans have been occluded. So we're trying to test if the model is able to recapture the segmentation of these two cans. And here, as you can see, uh, our model is actually successful in doing that. Now let's look at video object segmentation in general. I find it useful to look at it from a memory perspective. That is, for any method, they will first have to memorize features in the first frame. So the first frame input is then image and then mask. So the, the method will have to compare some sort of representation of this pair and store it in the memory. Next, to summon a new period frame, we're trying to read from this memory. We get some features from there, and we use that to summon this new frame. Lastly, and also optionally, we can update our memory representation with this mask in order to adapt to any appearance changes in the video. One paradigm of Pyworks is the recurring model. So what it does is it first initializes some hidden state using the input image and mask. Then for any new key frame, we have an encoder decoder structure. And there's also an RNN in there. This RNN can be say an LCM or a GRU. This RNN takes the hidden state as input and produce some representation that the decoder can use to segment this object. It also produces a new hidden state for the next frame to use. 
you can continue this propagation process to some other new frames. Here, the hidden state is used as memory. And since we are updating it every single frame, its representation will start to drift. Also, we'll run into a lot of classical problems that we have with RNN, such as vanishing grading. Another line of work is the attention-based model, which a lot of CLD algorithms use. So first we initialize the memory bank by having the input image and mass in the memory. We can use a memory encoder to compute some representation of this image mass pair. Then for any new frame that we want to segment, we fit them into a query encoder, which gives us the query. And we get key and value from the memory encoder. With this three, we can compute attention, and the output of the attention will be used in a decoder, which gives us the final output mass. And then we want to update our memory bank, which can be done by simply copying the input image and output mass into a memory bank. Now we have two items in the memory bank. Then for any new frame that comes in, we do the same set of operation. We again, compare attention over a memory bank. Since attention is done over a set, we can actually use the same algorithm and the same set of parameters in order to do this operation. So notice that the memory bank will grow over time because we're continuously appending new things into the memory bank. That will lead to a prohibitive computational and memory cost when we're processing very long sequences. To solve these problems, we are taking inspiration from the human memory. The Eggleston Schiffen memory model theorized that human memory is made up of three different components: a sensory memory, a working memory, and a long-term memory. Our model in the implements these three types of feature memory instead of using just one as in PyWorks. The sensory memory is the fastest reacting. And it's also locality sensitive, which means it contains positional information. The working memory updates at six hertz, so it's slower. But it contains high resolution features, which we can use for key key matching, which is basically attention matching. And because of this high resolution, we only keep it around for a few seconds. To complement that, we have a long-term memory. The long-term memory is only updated when the working memory becomes full. And it contains compact features that are consolidated from the working memory. Because of this compactness, we can actually keep these features for a long time. We can keep it for tens of thousands of frames without running into any GPU memory problem. Here we take a brief look on how we use these three types of memory. First, given the input image and mass, we initialize the sensor memory and the working memory. And the long-term memory starts off as empty. Then as any new frames comes in, we perform memory reading, which reads from all three types of memory. That produces a unified representation, which we then use to generate a new mass. With this mass, we can update all three types of memory. Notice that the sensitive memory is, up, is updated every single frame. The working memory is only updated every hour per frame, where hour is maybe five or 10. And the long-term memory is only updated when the working memory becomes full. So these three types of memory update at different frequencies. We'll, we would cover more details on each of these memory types in our paper, but here I want to talk more about the long-term memory specifically. The long-term memory is essentially a compression of the working memory. So the working memory is of size C by THW, where C is the number of frames that are currently in the working memory, and H and W are image dimensions. THW together is typically over 15,000, so it's quite large, especially when we compute attention over this THW dimension. So what the long-term memory is trying to do is to reduce C by THW to just C by P. Where P is a much smaller number, like 128. But how do we do that? Here we propose to use a selection algorithm. That is, we are picking P prototypes from the THW set. And intuitively, we want to pick the elements that are important, that are representative, of the THW set such that uh, only little information is lost in this process. 
how do we define importance? Well, here we define importance by the frequency of use in the working memory. So we call that we access the working memory through attention. And in attention, we compute an affinity matrix. The affinity matrix tells us how much contribution each working memory element has on the output. By accumulating and remembering this contribution, we can find out which elements are actually important. They are actually contributing to the output a lot. Um, this frequently accessed elements should be kept in the long-term memory. Therefore, we use this as a metric in order to pick elements that are important. In this sense, the working memory is acting as a buffer before entering into the long-term memory. Here we show some quantitative results of our method. So these numbers are measured in JNF, which is the average of our U and boundary reference score, the higher the better. We also test our method on several different datasets that has videos with different names. For example, the direct data set uh, contains videos of around 100 frames. The YouTube data set is longer. And we also test it on a long video data set, which has around 7,000 frames per video. We also report the IPS of this method. So there are a few baselines that we're looking at here. The first one is AFBURR. Uh, this is a method that is dedicated to processing long video. What it does is it tries to compress features eagerly. So features are compressed as soon as they come in. And this way, they're actually losing out on the high resolution features that they can otherwise use. In our model, however, since we have a working memory, we can preserve this high resolution feature. So FGBUR actually does not perform well in the short term. The next method is AOT. AOT is an attention-based method. Instead of using a single layer of attention, it uses a transformer. It performs well in the short term, but it doesn't really perform well in the long term because the transformer is using up a lot of memory. The next one is STCN, which is kind of like a baseline of our work. It is like a, a working memory only model. And it performs okay in both short term and long term, but uh, especially in the long term, it is not as good as our method. The takeaway here is that our method uses all three types of memory stores, actually performs well in both short term and long term. And we're not sacrificing accuracy on the short term in order to achieve that long term performance. Here we show the FPS with respect to a number of processes frames. The blue curve is for SCCN, and the y-axis is FPS in the log scale. So you can see that SCCN actually slows down a lot as it process more frames, because as, the, as, as this memory bank expands, it actually takes a lot more time to read from a larger memory. The other curves are all XMAP. They have different LTMAX. LTMAX basically says, how many memory elements we can keep in the long-term memory. And once the work, the long-term memory reaches that limit, we simply discard the least frequently used long-term memory elements. You can see that our method slows down a lot slower. And when LTMAX is rich, the running time will actually become constant. Next, we show some abation study of the memory stores. Uh, the first row is for is our method with all the memory stores, which is our baseline. Next, we shall remove the sensor memory. Our model performed worse in both short term and long term. There's a modest decrease in performance. And if we remove the working memory, which in turn also remove the long term memory, because the working memory is the basis for the long term memory. It actually performs a lot worse in both short term and long term, especially in the long term. Because without the working memory, it becomes a sensory memory only model, which is basically a recurrent model. And we know the recurrent model doesn't work well in the long term. Lastly, we also try to remove the long term memory, which makes the performance on short term data a little bit better, but it doesn't work on long video data. And this method is also a lot slower. Here we can look at some video editing effects of our method. 
So this is actually done with our interactive GUI that you can also download from our project page. So we are kind of dealing with like a panoptic mask propagation setting here. We're first importing a mask from our hub disk, and then the user can correct part of this mask or to add new objects that are potentially not in the vocabularies of that existing segmentation method. And after annotating the first frame or some frame in between, then the user can ask our algorithm to propagate that mask to the rest of the video. So although our method is not trained on this background semantic mask, it is doing an okay job in segmenting and tracking those masks. And then with those masks, we can do some simple video editing effects. So here we're only demonstrating some very simple ones, but uh, I imagine someone can take this mask and apply some more advanced video processing techniques. Here we show a fairly case of our method. So there are two dots. One annotated with a red mask and one with green mask. So since the appearance of these two dots are very similar and they're close together, our method is actually having a very hard time distinguishing these two dots. So this is a fairy case that, that we see quite often. Our project page contains all our code and more quality results. We also provide an interactive demo GUI that you can use and try to summon your own videos. Thank you. Hi. My name is Viraj Prabhu, and I'll be presenting our work on augmentation consistency guided self training for source free domain adaptive semantic segmentation. This is joint work with Shivam Kare, Diksha Karthik, and Judy Hoffman. Adapting deep models to new visual domains is an important problem since it's impractical to collect a large label dataset for every new application. And ideally, we would want to be able to train our models, say, on cheap simulated label data and deploy it to work in uh, the real world on unlabeled target data, overcoming what is known as a domain shift. Further, even after deployment, uh, a model is likely to continue to encounter data distribution shift, uh, for example, with changing weather patterns. Uh, and we want systems that can adapt to these changing conditions in the wild. This has been studied extensively as the problem of unsupervised domain adaptation, where we are given labeled task data from a source domain, unlabeled data from a target domain, and the goal is to develop a model that generalizes well to held out target data. However, UDA methods assume access to the source data during adaptation. Uh, and they perform continued supervised training on the source as shown here on the bottom, where you continue to optimize some supervised cross entropy loss on your labeled source images, uh, while also performing some sort of domain alignment using source and target images. And if you didn't have access to these source images during adaptation, uh, these methods frequently just diverge from their task and don't end up uh, performing well at all on the target. But um, we argue that source data may actually be unavailable after deployment in some situations. So for example, you may have privacy restrictions in medical applications, or you may have IP restrictions. So you may not know what uh, you know, proprietary data your source model was trained on. Uh, similarly, um, for edge devices like the Amazon Alexa, for example, uh, if you want to do adaptation, uh, you might have certain compute restrictions. Uh, and finally, you could also have memory restrictions if you are interested in a heavy task such as, you know, semantic segmentation, and it may be infeasible to keep all your uh, source data on board to do adaptation. So ideally, we want to develop a fast on-device test time adaptation approach. Um, so test time domain adaptation aims to adapt a source model to the target given only unlabeled target data. So you have a trained source model and now you have to adapt it to this target data which has some distribution shift and you no longer have access to your labeled source data, right? Uh, and there is some prior work in this space that makes use of parameter constrained self-training. So a very popular recent method called TENT which stands for test time adaptation by entropy minimization, 
First performs regular source training where all model parameters shown here by theta are updated to learn the task using labeled data on the source. And the second test time adaptation phase, uh, they only update a subset of model parameters shown here by this delta uh, to minimize predictive entropy on the target data, right? Without any access to the source data while keeping the other, all other model parameters as frozen. Um, and in practice, the parameter subset that they find to work best is to update the model's batch norm parameters. Uh, so the normalization and affine parameters uh, and everything else is kept frozen. And this method does pretty well uh, at preserving task performance and actually improving it on, on target data without uh, source uh, access. Uh, so we're interested in doing test time adaptation for semantic segmentation. Um, so we have, you know, labeled source data from say the GTA 5 data set, and we have our target is to run is our real images from the cityscapes data set, right? And these are unlabeled. And the goal of course is to develop a model that can produce this kind of uh, segment per pixel um, segmentation as shown on the right. Where the uh, where the colors uh, the legend for the colors is shown here, so th the challenge we discovered is that th the sort of unconstrained self training approach that that tent performs is actually detrimental to performance on the tail uh, for semantic segmentation. So for tail categories that don't have a lot of examples. So consider this example, and this is uh, the prediction from a model trained on the GTFI and. Uh, tested on a cityscapes image, right? Uh, so it's like pretty noisy at the beginning, as you can see. Uh, for example, it's predicting sidewalk here on the road. And then if we apply tent for 50 iterations and then continue for 100 iterations and then uh, keep training for a, an entire epoch, you get this cleaner looking prediction. So it's cleaned up uh, you know, a lot of these predictions in the road, but you'll notice that compared to the ground truth here shown on the left, uh, a lot of the predictions for these tail categories, such as the stop sign here and this person on this motorbike are entirely missing. So performance on these tail classes is actually sort of degrading with this method uh, at the cost of performance on other um, categories. So we want to address this. And our solution is based on augmentation consistency guided self-training. Um, so our main intuition that instead of self-training on all model predictions, uh, it makes more sense to self-train only on reliable model predictions that have a high likelihood of being correct. Of course, we don't have labels, so we actually don't know which ones are correct. We need some proxy measure of reliability. And we can continue to only update batch norm parameters as 10 does to prevent task drift. But then the question is, how do we identify reliable predictions? And uh, particularly, we could use model confidence, but it's actually known to be unreliable under a domain shift. So instead, we propose using predictive consistency under augmentations, which I'll make concrete shortly. Uh, but before that, one question we uh, try to answer is which augmentations should we use? So we find it's beneficial to, to measure predictive consistency across diverse target views that vary in multiple ways. So consider this original image, we can apply a per pixel uh, appearance transformation, for example, a jitter operation to get this kind of image here. And similarly, you can apply a crop and resize operation, uh, which varies both the scale of different objects, as well as the spatial context to get this sort of image here on the right. And then we can kind of, so what we end up with are very diverse looking target views. And we'll show that you know, this is kind of uh, a good uh, set of views to measure predictive consistency across. So here's how our algorithm um, is designed. Uh, so it's called Augmentation Consistency Guided Self-Training or AUGCO for short. So first, of course, you have labels uh, source data and you uh, can perform supervised cross entropy uh, training on, on this label source data in the first phase where you learn all model parameters. Then we no longer have access to source data. We just have this trained model and we only have unlabeled target data as shown here, right? Um, and now what we do is first we can get a prediction on this image from the source model as shown here on the right. 
and then we can apply a, a, a color jitter and a resize operation to this random crop here, right, to generate this augmented image. And this is all these operations are uh, the parameters are selected randomly. Um, and we can get a prediction on this augmented image uh, as shown here, which we call view two. And to get an aligned prediction from the first view, we apply the same resize operation to the to an identical crop, uh, and we get this aligned uh, rep, uh, view one here, as shown on uh, the top. And so now you'll notice that we actually have you know aligned predictive views, and we can measure pixel level predictive consistency across these. So this is a consistency map where dark green, uh, where where light green denotes that this model made the same prediction across views. Uh, and similarly, we also find it beneficial to look at model confidence uh, as an additional source of information. Um, and we can uh, use both these consistency and confidence maps um, to uh, measure overall reliability. And finally, we can perform selective self-training uh, where we only self-train on instances that the model has found to be reliable via these two proxy measures. And again, we also uh, only optimize the model's batch number parameters here instead of all parameters, in addition to a diversity regularizer. Uh, and you can find more details in the paper. So we present results on standard semantic segmentation adaptation benchmarks, including GTFI to cityscapes, Cynthia to cityscapes and cityscapes to dark Zurich night. Um, and here are our results. So we compare, we look at mean intersection over union or MIOU on the target test set. Um, and we are comparing performance to several baselines, including tent, uh, which I described earlier, and a state of the art method uh, called source 3DA or SFDA. Uh, so first, on GTFI to cityscapes, we find that our method uh, considerably outperforms the next best method, SFDA, and uh, provides a very strong boost over just the source model, uh, as well as tent, uh, which provides a relatively small boost. Similarly, on Cynthia to cityscapes, we again outperform baselines um, by a somewhat narrower margin. Um, and finally, we also see very strong gains on our third cityscapes to dark Zurich night benchmark, where we uh, obtain a strong gain over the next best method. So across these uh, diverse ships, uh, we find that our method, while being very simple, actually sets a new state of the art. And interestingly, uh, it does so within a single epoch of adaptation. So a single pass over your target data, uh, which also makes it considerably faster than some of these recent approaches. For example, SFDA, which is uh, trained for uh, over 100 epochs. Uh, so our method also kind of has an efficiency advantage. And we performed some analysis. Uh, so first we tried to look at, you know, what subset of data should you be self-training on? So again, uh, we find that if you self-train on all data as Tent does, you would get a relatively low MYOU. If you did only, if you only used confidence, it would do really poorly because as I mentioned earlier, confidence is unreliable under a domain shift. If you use consistency, that is significantly more reliable as shown here. And finally, it's optimal to actually combine both of these two and you can get a slight boost by using confidence and consistency. Uh, secondly, we uh, study you know, what types of augmentations uh, are ideal to measure consistency under. So again, we find that you know, both spatial and pixel level augmentations work really well and the optimal strategy is to combine the two. So using both spatial and pixel level augmentations is, is optimal. Uh, and finally, here are some qualitative results. Um, so shown here on the in the first column is the target image. This is the ground truth. These are predictions from the source model with MIOU in the bottom right. This is what happens if you apply tent and you'll see that MIOU does improve across all of these cases. Uh, but uh, when we apply our method, we can both significantly boost MIOU as shown here uh, over something like tent. And we also find that a majority of our gains come from, you know, tail underrepresented categories such as this traffic sign here and, 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 this, uh, and, and here as well. And we also highlight some failure cases in red here. So where the model is still 
um, sort of failing and uh, it's kind of avenues for follow-up work. Um, so to quickly summarize, uh, source data may be unavailable after deployment in adaptation and for reasons such as privacy or memory or compute restrictions. And so test time adaptation is actually a really practical DA setting um, where we want to adapt using only a trained source model and unlabeled target data. But full self-training uh, does pretty poorly on things like on, on tasks like semantic segmentation where you have this huge label imbalance. Uh, and so we instead propose using augmentation consistency to guide self-training. Uh, and we find that both using spatial and pixel augmentations helps and we can get state-of-the-art results with this relatively simple method uh, within a single pass over target data. So thanks for listening and please uh, feel free to send any questions you might have uh, to this email address. Um, so thanks. I'm Long Lian, a PhD student at UC Berkeley. Today I'm really excited to present our work on supervised selective labeling for more effective semi-supervised learning by UC Berkeley and ICSI. Semi-supervised learning or SSL learns a classifier that leverages a small set of labeled data and a large set of unlabeled data in the same distribution. Cutting edge SSL methods are approaching fully supervised learning accuracy and are entering low label regime. For example, SSL method Sinclair V2 gets 93% of supervised accuracy on ImageNet with only 12 samples per class. In this low label setting, the quality of labeled samples is very important. However, previous model-centric SSL methods assume that labeled and unlabeled data are given. These methods focus on finding the right model architecture and training recipe and neglecting the data aspect. In contrast, we aim to design an unsupervised data-centric method that selects the optimal subset of the unlabeled data for annotation within annotation budget. In this work, we present a method of unsupervised selective labeling and show that small compute on selective labeling leads to large gains in SSL accuracy. Selecting the right data to label for the sake of model optimization is also the focus of active learning. However, unlike active learning that begins from labels of random samples to get a sense of the task, our instance selection is completely unsupervised, which makes our task much harder. Being able to solve this challenging task makes our method much more label efficient since we have no wasted annotation of randomly selected samples required by active learning. If every point represents a sample in unlabeled data, and we're expected to pick three of them for annotation, what should we pick? The green triangle selections are outliers and hence not representative enough. The yellow square selections don't have enough coverage or diversity. The red star selections are both diverse and representative and are a good fit. Based on these two criteria, we first propose a training-free USL in which representativeness is achieved through density estimation. Diversity, on the other hand, is achieved through clustering and cross-cluster communication. Our training-free USL assumes a fixed feature space learned by self-supervised learning methods such as MoCo, Simclear, or CLD. For additional flexibility, we also propose training-based USLT that performs end-to-end -end clustering and learns feature and selection at the same time. We formulate smoothness assumption and cluster assumption commonly used in SSL in our local and global constraints in order to learn improved feature and clustering. See our paper for details. Without changing SSL models and their training recipes, fixed match with USL selected samples reaches an astonishing accuracy of 93.5% on CIFAR 10 with only 40 label samples. This result is comparable to AL or SSAL with a thousand labels. So USL is up to 25 times more sample efficient. The 40 sample selection with the lowest scores is very imbalanced and truncated that could mislead the classifier. The objects with the highest scores is much more balanced and representative and is selected by USL. USL also leads to more label efficient SSL or large scale datasets and is able to leverage multi-model clip models for even better performance. Moreover, our improvement is more prominent with lower budget with 0.2% labeled data, which is around two labeled samples per class. We get 14% improvement on ImageNet.
the x-axis is accuracy with random selection for annotation. The y-axis is accuracy with USL and USLT. Our method consistently works with various SSL methods. Integrating USL to SSL methods is straightforward and it involves only switching the label set. We encourage our viewers to also try USL on their favorite SSL methods. Thanks for attending our session. Our paper and code are available through the QR code. Good morning, everyone. This is Vignesh, and I work for a European retail firm called Zalana. And today, I'm very excited to talk to you about our recent work on using diffusion models for outfit rendering. Generating images of fashion models wearing curated outfits and in desired posts has the potential to disrupt the fashion e-commerce industry. A tool that allows circumventing the need for a human model physically wearing the outfit combinations would allow unprecedented creative control over studio fashion imagery. And such a tool enables retail firms to onboard their articles to online platforms more easily. However, synthesizing images with desired content is a challenging computer vision task. Previous versions of the outfit renderer involved design based on GANs. And that comes that, that brings along with it problems associated with GANs themselves, like train stability, mode coverage, etc. In recent years, diffusion models have achieved state-of-the-art performance on various tasks, including conditional image generation. And in this work, we present Diff Fashion, a diffusion model-based fashion outfit render. And we show effective ways of utilizing guided diffusion model for our particular use case of subject-driven generation of fashion images. We demonstrate several key mechanisms in the architecture of the diffusion model that allow for reconstructing the input garments on the rendered digital human. The main contributions in this paper can be briefly summarized as a diffusion model based outfit renderer and composing multiple outfits with, with the help of deep set embeddings, blob attention to capture the fluidity of the outfit on the digital human, simulating classified free guidance with article dropping during training. The diffusion model here is trained using pairs of outfits and a real human model wearing these outfits. And we feed these input conditions of posts and outfits to the diffusion model. For the posts, 16 key points extracted from ground truth images are from a pre-trained post estimating method are then passed by concatenating them with the Gaussian noise to the input of the autoencoding auto structure to the diffusion model. The set of outfits should influence and strongly condition the final image generated. So we have explored two approaches to making this condition work. In order to process a variable number of outfits during inference, we use a deep set architecture. First, we process each outfit pack shot image by an encoder in the form of a ResNet50 model, pre-trained on the ImageNet dataset and further fine-tuned on the downstream dataset. The deep set representation is a thousand dimensional embedding, which is then combined with a typical time embedding in the adaptive group normalization layer of the autoencoding structure in the diffusion model. This allows for faithfulness of the generated image to the variable number of input outputs. While this mechanism acts as a feature extractor collapsing the conditioning outfits images to a vector performing extreme compression of the image information, and so to avoid loss of fine textural details, we also consider an additional pathway that pass more information from the outfits by directly leveraging the image spatial structure. And this we call as CAP or cross attention with post. We propose to treat the set of outfits as a single image by concatenating the outfits spatially and making a composite image. Afterwards, we calculate the dot attention with key and value tensors that are functions of the outfits and query tensor, which depends on the pose of the generated human. The output of the attention can be directly concatenated as channels to the input noise of the diffusion process. An advantage of the structure is, is that it is permutation invariant and can use input outputs of any size. The dot attention mechanism will copy information from each of the spatial regions of the outputs 
and pass it to the right positions according to the query. In practice, parts of the query will activate with different regions of the orbifers. Example, the legs key point will copy for a trouser image and the torso key point will copy for a shirt image. And all of these regions are spatially combined and the trainable attention parameters will adapt to facilitate these right activations. Finally, we employ classifier guidance. That is, during training, we randomly drop out the variable number of out outfits to a minimum of one. And then this simulates the diffusion model to learn not just the conditional distribution, but also the, un but also the uh, marginal distribution of, of the data distribution. Here we show uh, some results of our different methods by giving the input outfits that, that is shown in the left. In our experimental results, we find that our method combining all the three mechanisms, that is DEF full, are more faithful to the input conditions, capturing the fine textural details. The findings were also reflected in a qualitative evaluation in the form of visual inspection with a user study. Users preferred our method, which combined all the three mechanisms for faithful reconstruction of the image, which is represented in the second question. And in the first question of which digital human looks more realistic, users preferred for, the, for our method, which combined both the information pathway, that is the deep set embedding, as well as the cross attention it posed. And this is simply due to people preferring uh, this is this is due to the diffusion model rendering the output image uh, based on the conditional distribution, which which uh, gives more weightage to also the human. But in the case of DF full, since it performs classifier free guidance, it considers both the p of x and p of x given y, and gives more weightage to p of x given y, and hence it is it. Hence, users prefer the, that the outfit is more accurately represented by the F1. And for the case of outfit renderer, reconstructing the outfit more accurately is the most important problem. Moving on to conclusion, the first and foremost requirement for enabling a meaningful virtual try-on or to replace the, the expensive process of studio fashion imagery is the ability to faithfully reconstruct input garments on a body. And our method can accurately reconstruct the outfits due to its ability to retain the high frequency details with the help of these dual information pathway, as well as employing classic equipment. I thank you for your time and look forward to further discussions. Thank you. Hello there. This is Tian Chen Zhao from Georgia University and Linka Research. Today, I'm going to present our work in language-aware object detections with large-scale vision language pre-training. First, let me briefly describe the background. Object detection, or OD, is a classical task of computer vision. Previously, the OD task has been focusing on learning from a fixed data set with a fixed and a small vocabulary, such as AD classes in COCO. And when we train uh, for each task, we usually train a separate model for each data set. In a classical system such as YOLO, FastRCNN are all best examples in this branch of research. Recently, benefited from large-scale vision language pre-training, a lot of research has been focusing on extending the classical OD to open vocabulary or language-aware OD, where the vocabulary size going from the classical 20 or 80 classes to more than 10,000 classes or even full natural language sentences, such as referral expression comprehension. And in this case, a join model should learn for all the classes instead of a separate model for each class. An example cl uh, model will be like Field from Google, Datic from Facebook, or Glib from Microsoft. And in this branch of research, this uh, is also the focus of our study. And in this study, we raised a research question that is, can a detector learn from many, many different OD data sets with increasing total voc visual vocabulary? And eventually, 
this model can achieve open world cover detection capabilities. And in the following graph, we wish the model can continuously learn from increasing number of data sets and it can accumulate knowledge in its parameters and eventually it can achieve a very, very large and open vocabulary detection performance. However, to achieve this problem or to solve this problem in this manner, there are two challenges that have to be solved. The first challenge is we call it the taxonomy conflict. By looking at the picture, you can see that the football or the same object in different data sets, they have different names. Sometimes it's conflicting, sometimes it's including, sometimes it's excluding. And usually the last layer of a classical OD model using a fixed softmax as a classifier to detecting the object types into one of the classes. And a fixed softmax object classifier cannot learn from different class labels. And this is the first challenge. The second challenge is we call the foreground and background inconsistency. By looking at this picture with the pizza object, it's considered as a foreground in Coco, but it is considered as a background in Pascal VOC because there's no pizza class in Pascal VOC class. By learning from this data set, it will lead to conflicts of background foreground detection and confuse the model. To solve these two problems, we propose OMDET, a novel vision language based detection method. We formulate the problem as a language condition OD task, where a language aware OD localization head and the object classification head is proposed. We call it MDN, multimodal detection network. By using this way, we solve both problems. First, we solve the taxonomy conflict problem by label embeddings, where we're encoding the tasks using language encoders where it can make models the fine-grained granularities and differences between different class labels. And second, we solve the foreground and the background inconsistent problem via the language aware OD localizer, where the task is input as one of the input with together with the, the, the image input and a early fusion method is used to iteratively refine and fuse those two sources of information and eventually output the proposal, the object localization and a classification. So specifically, one of the main novelty is the multimodal detection network that's being proposed. We deploy a deep fusion method where we're using multi-head self-attention to do merge attention um, between the text input and the language input. In here, the Q and T are both the, the Q are representing the proposal feature where the T represent the text features. And we apply this iteratively in the sparse RCN framework where we have six layers of iterations. And this will combine the information from the proposal to the text and then combine with the vision. And then it will try to predict the object. And then this gives us a better feature representation of object and this process will iterate. And in training, essentially, we propose this following uh, random batch generation framework, where at each batch of image, we randomly select it as a D, and then we randomly select K labels from the vocab of D, and then we're encoding those K labels and form a task. And then we repeat until we get a full batch. And then we, we put this batch into the model, do a forward pass, and then backprop. So our study uh, contained two parts. To evaluate the model and validate the, the correctness of the proposed method, the first study we did is a multi data set joint learning ability uh, experiment. In here, we're trying to verify if the proposed method actually solved the two problems or the two challenges of multi data set learning, namely the taxonomy conflict and the background and the foreground inconsistency. In here, we try to train a model that can simultaneously master four tasks, which are MS Coco, Pascal VOC, wider phase, and a wider pedestrian, with a variety of different class labels and the image training size. And we compare four models. One is the sparse RCN, which is the base, uh, base detection model. And then also we try to train OMDET on the data set singly 
just we call om that single. So which is same, we didn't use the multi data set training ability. And the third baseline is got om that shallow, where we removed MDN and only deploy shallow fusion, just like the one used in Datic. And lastly is our proposed method. In this results, we can see that the OM that is able to achieve the best performance among all the tasks. And based on the results here, there are several interesting takeaways. First of all, OM that single is as good as Spatial CRM. They serve as a sanity check to prove that the proposed OM that will degenerate to a normal Spatial CRM when we use just for a single task and it performs as well as the normal one, and slightly better in some tasks. And the second, whom that solve the foreground and background and taxonomic difference. This can be seen by looking at ohm that versus the ohm that shallow or ohm that sparse RCM. We found that not only oh, the ohm that shallow will lead to great performance job in COCO and, the past, uh, and also in some other task when we train this ohm shallow and all of the tasks together. However, we can see that ohm that when we're using the ohm that with the deep fusion, it's able to achieve much better score or at least similar score compared to training, training on the single one. And the last takeaway is we found that the multi data set learning actually leads to co-learning across data set, which is particularly helpful for the task where with limited data. You can see here, Coco is the largest, largest data set here, which share a similar performance between ohm that and ohm single. But for the, all the other three tasks, it benefits a lot when we compare ohm single with ohm that, increasing from 45 to 60 on Pascal, 23 to 30 in wider phase, and 33 to 46 in wider pedestrian. And we can see from a more qualitative example here, where we found the ohm that shallow will miss a lot of objects because it's confused about foreground and background when training together. But on ohm that, it has no problem of detecting the right background and foreground given the task it's giving. And then we're going to a lot more large scale pre-training scenario and testing on the ODNW, which is the 35 data set used for this workshop. And we can look at the large scale pre-training data set, including five corpus, which are Coco, Elvis, Object 365, Phrase Cut, and the GCC. And they have different image sizes and also different label sizes and also different annotation source. The last one is a pseudo label generating from GLIP. And when looking at the results, we found that there's a clear, clear curve of improvement of zero shot performance, full model training, fine tuning, head tuning, uh, with more pre-training data, proving the effectiveness of increasing more data set to learning to leading to better performance. And we achieved the best score with ohm that base when we're training on all data set with the convex base backbone. And it is able to surpass the baseline, which is the GLIP. And even for the ohm that with the tiny backbone, it also be able to surpass the GLIP tiny baseline. Then we look at two more interesting analysis of the model. First, we look at different pre-training size and the relationship between the data set that we have. And we're dividing the 35 tasks into three different categories. The first one is the few shot one, which are less than 20, 20 training samples. And then the second one is the median shot one, which are data sets with less than, uh, more than 200 to 2000 training samples. And the last one is the big shot one, which are data sets with more than 2000 training samples. And we look at the table here, it's clear that with more pre-training, the ohm that a model is able to achieve better scores, especially on few shot and medium shot settings. And for the big shot one, the difference is smaller or less. And this means that the pre-training is most effective in the few shot and medium shot setting and also we're looking at the parameter efficient training setting, where we found that more pre-training leads to great less difference between full model fine tuning versus only high fine tuning or prompt fine tuning. This means that more pre-training with larger vocabulary size leads to stronger backbone features or head features, 
making it less necessary to fine tune the whole model to adapt to a new task. We can also further look at this within this curve here where the horizontal axis is the vocabulary side in log scale and the vertical axis is the AP in different settings. They clearly uh, improve as, we, as more vocabulary size is included in pre-training. Lastly, we look at some demo outputs where the ABLE system is be able to give some random task. It can dynamically change its behavior by detecting the right classes. And we're giving three very different uh, tasks given the same image. The entire detection process is different. It means that it actually learns the process we wanted to learn. To conclude, this work proposed OMDAT, a novel language aware detection model. It solved the foreground and background problems and also able to solve the text number inconsistency problem. It's able to achieve strong performance in multiple data sets, including COCO, Pascal, Miterface, Pedestrian, and as well as the certified task in ODNW. And lastly, and most interestingly, we're showing that the more visual concepts leads to better parameter efficient and a future performance. Thank you for listening. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, all the great um, uh, eight uh, spotlight talks. Uh, congratulations to the acceptance of the workshop paper again. So note that, um, as you uh, also noticed that uh, most of the workshop papers, they are really in good high quality. Um, either they have been submitted to the uh, some uh, ECCV main conference, uh, the Incoming Europe's conference or previous like CVPR 2022 conference. So they're uh, really organized and also uh, very uh, rigidly being been written. So uh, so I, I have also pasted a, a link inside the chat, chat channel, uh, which we encourage most of the uh, submissions that to go through a more rigid process uh, which is the IJCV special issues, which is due on uh, March the 1st for next year. Uh, yeah, and also for anyone like in our, uh, currently like for any audience who is also interested in related topics, please also feel free to uh, submit your work if you're interested. Mm -hmm.